Buen día a todos, buenos días. Uh, good morning, everybody. Es un placer muy grande para mí estar aquí como Kino Speaker en Barcelona, donde también he podido vivir y estudiar hace muchos años. Voy a pasar al inglés como es el idioma oficial para presentar, pero después las preguntas pueden ser en castellano o en catalán. So as you see from the title, uh, I would like to address uh, three main themes. The process, the community and the business of open design, which I think are probably the most important themes, at least for my research in uh, building and developing uh, open design systems. But first, we start with seeing, having a look at the current uh, discussion about open design, what's actually happening uh, right now, or at least in the past uh, 12 months. So one of the first things that's become very interesting last year was that it was invited in Brussels for a co-design workshop for developing the policies for the uh, European Union regarding design. It was a very hard workshop with a lot of different people, and of course, everybody has its own agenda and different uh, interests and different ideas and also perspective on the world of design. But I was invited specifically for bringing open design and digital fabrication. And one thing that was really uh, interesting that I wasn't the only one uh, favorable to open design, because of course it was controversial, but at least two other more people were pushing this idea of open design. And probably this is why also open design made it in the final recommendation. So then a few months later, they published one book with 21 uh, recommendations for the policy of design in the future. And the number eight is about open design, about create guidelines, code of practice, legal frameworks, and experimental spaces to promote open design. And experimental spaces here means fabulous and similar spaces, which were also controversial. It was very funny to discover that for some people, fab labs are not a reality yet. But then I started to, to do a bit of research and then discovered that also talking with people, there is no common definition of open design. So it's, sometimes it's very difficult to dis, uh, discuss about the same thing, also because somebody is working on open design in fashion design, somebody else in graphic design. So there is no common understanding. And I did a bit of research and I discovered that yes, there was one technical definition of open design, but it was from the year 2000. So probably it was even before open design actually exists, at least the first real cases of open design for me happened in 1999 with Think Cycle of MIT. So it was really the beginning. And doing a bit of research even further, I discovered that basically this open design definition is just a version of the open source definition, which was developed in 1997. And it just changed the word software to design and it's almost, almost the same. But of course, it's not the same talking about software and about design. Also, one problem of that open design definition that it was under copyright. There was only a webmaster contact to, to send an email, so there was no way of discussing that. So the basically situation is that we don't have a common definition of open design, at least we don't have a discussion about yet. And then it happened last year that I was working in Helsinki while I was living there. I was working on the organization of the Open Knowledge Festival. Uh, as for the Open Knowledge Foundation. It was the first festival we did for the Open Knowledge Foundation before they have some conferences, and also they have one conference this year. And we try to bring uh, many more aspects of open knowledge inside the conference, not just open data and open content, but also open hardware, open design. So we had one specific track of open hardware, open design, and publication and making. And we decide also, me and other organizers, to create a working group about open design and now it's also open hardware in the Open Knowledge Foundation, and specifically also for pushing the discussion about open design for the festival and also for the first month. The Open Knowledge Foundation works with separate working groups. They are almost autonomously and independently work. So you can also participate in that. It works basically as an open source community. So there is a mailing list that you can discuss with people. But there are also just projects, not just discussions. So one of the first projects that we started, the first one was actually having an open design definition that will be really open source and open process. So we started having a discussion in GitHub and working on it really as it was a piece of open source software. And the idea is also that we can use GitHub because then you can fork, you can modify uh, your own version of the definition, starting from this one. So even if we don't agree on this one, there might be even different discussion and we can agree later or merge the versions later. And of course, it's still under construction, it's still under work. So you can 
participate in that. Actually, we are welcome you to participate. That we would be really happy to have more people as possible discussing open design in that definition. And we have a few things already. The first thing is that we wanted to focus not just on open design as industrial design, but generally as a design artifact, so focusing on all the kind of design. The second thing that we recognize that basically just opening design probably is not enough. It's a good way for uh, uncovering the political dimension of design or discovering what's actually happening and taking place in the social and political dimension and economical dimension, but it's not enough. And the third thing is that we wanted to focus not just on design as an outcome, but also design as a verb to design something, so a process. Design as documentation, so the drawings and the blueprints of design. And also design as an outcome, so the final dozen aircraft that you can use. I wanted to address all of these. And yes, the idea was that this definition will be something generic for all design, and then you can fork it and create a specific sub-definition sub for graphic design, fashion design, whatever. The current discussion mainly now is focused on understanding how to share open design. Because the definition are a technical document, they're not manifesto, but they are sort of. They are dry definition, dry dis meaning of technical dimension, so they don't cover all the social aspect of open source or open design. But at least they specifically say what can be regarded as open source or not, open design or not in this case. And the case in open design that it's a very difficult landscape when it comes to protecting or sharing it. So you cannot use a Creative Commons for all the open design. You can use it when it, the design itself can be protected by copyright, so probably in graphic design. But with fashion design, industrial design, interior design, it's completely different. Probably service design even doesn't have some way of protecting or sharing. So what we are doing now is trying to, uh, having a framework that explains to people how to do open design, or at least how to share it on a legal way. And then there is one thing about the process that leads us then to the process section. Um, we wanted to say that basically there is no specific process for open design. There are many different possible processes for open design. And then, of course, if you don't specify which kind of process, that's not a big, very important. I mean, it can be open design, a chair can be open design, even if you don't say how you did that. But in case that you want to specifically say how it was designed, and then you want to say to other people, okay, we design it in that way, then also that documentation has to be made open to make the open design really open. So it's still part of open design, even the process. So yes, process is the first theme that I've been addressing since 2005, because it's very important if you want to have few, few, more people working together on the same project and not a lot of people working individually on a lot of small projects. And for example, this is very important because, uh, I don't know, but probably the main user experience of open source is just a website where you go and click on download and you just download the, the software. So it's also the main experience that you had for with SourceForge, for example, which was the main platform for developing uh, open source software, at least in the past years. You just search for the project and download, and it's mostly done by organizations, so it's not really transparent. But things now are changing. Because now the de facto standard for developing software is GitHub, which is a very different experience. It's more your personal experience and your network experience. So in GitHub, anybody can participate and have their own open source software or to have their word in any project independently. So it's more also rooted to the social networks of the people and their friends. So the user experience is becoming much more about having the involvement of people in the open source development process. And actually, it's the process, I think, that was most important in open source software, at least in the most important and successful open source software. This, for example, is a visualization of the development of the Python programming languages, language, which is open source. On the top, you see the lines represent people participating in the development. So you see, as more people are participating, you have more lines. And on the bottom, you have the size of the, and the complexity of the program itself. So you see, as more people participated in the process, then the, the program also grew in, grew in uh, complexity and richness. So it's very important to understand how to have a common process, also in open design, and not having only small projects. And then maybe, it seems very difficult, but actually it's very simple, at least the concept seems difficult, but it's very simple. And it's what I tried also to introduce with the concept of meta-design. It's not a new concept. 
there are many also different meanings of meta design. For some people, it's a way of creating some rough uh, objects or toolkits for other people to design, or some design environment, or the first step of the design development so that you can later design something. For me, meta design should be addressed as the design in the world design process. So the idea is that as a designer, we can have an awareness in really organizing our design process. And of course, how do we do that? Because this process is not like a chair, it's not like a website. It's more about interactions and flows. And for these kind of things, interaction and flows, what is very good about designing is service design, because there's a lot of tools about developing human interaction in space and time. So there is a way for designers to develop uh, the design process in a way that is familiar to them with service design. And then, of course, if you have your design process visualized with service design, then you can share with other people in the same process. So everybody can have an understanding of what's happening in the open process. So you can have open meta design by releasing the service design of the meta design as open source. Then there can be even a one further step if the process as open source and P2P dynamics, then you have an open process and open meta design, and what you're designing is actually open source. And that's what I actually call open P2P design when I started developing this. So the idea is that you can design with more people uh, a way for community to self organize using design tools. And that's what I did in 2005 with the master's thesis. And this is not very important, probably academically, but the importance was that in 2005, 2006, it was impossible to work on these topics. So basically, as soon as I had a website, I put everything online under Creative Commons. So by sharing it, I, I was able to, uh, to work in different countries, in different continents, and do a lot of workshops and lectures. And since, of course, this was 400 pages long, and it was in Italian, I also did a shorter version, both in Spanish and in English. And everything is open source, so you can access, and it was designed with open source software. So if you're curious, you can access it online. Then I have some examples. So this is, for example, a storyboard, which is very common in service design, displaying how the open design definition works. An interesting thing of this is that this wasn't done by hand, but it was done by open source software that create storyboards. So you can use also open source software in creating that. And then it's an easy way to explicitly uh, showing and sharing the design process together. There are other ways. One, for example, is this table, which is called participation metrics. It's a way, basically, of saying all the, the step in the design process, which level of participation the community they have. So in this case, this is for the open design definition. We started with a little uh, participation in the community, and we have more participation in, in the end. And of course, there are different kinds of graphs that are possible. <clears throat> so it depends on the specific design process and the specific resources and time that you have. And this is, for example, a system map that was designed in a workshop that I did in Singapore in 2009. The, project, the design project was a simple device for connecting chairs for letting students sleep in the university. So it was very simple. But this is basically the, the document explicitly saying the flows of materials, information, and money between all the people involved in the open design community. So all these roles that are with the red circle, they're basically the people involved in the open design community while other people are outside. And if you see this was done in a few hours, so it's already a complex system. And this is one of the versions that the students did. But it was very useful to version in this, like in open source uh, software, for understanding what was possible to do it also in a collaborative way. And this was interesting because, for example, in the way students design this system, there is one person or more than one person working in the public relation that gets all the money. Because the money comes from the student who buy the open design project, then the, the designer uh, and the students distributing that, and then the money goes to the public relation person who pays the manufacturer. And then everybody realized that there is only one person or only one role actually handling all the money. So in the second version, they changed this, and then they created more flows of money. And this was clear as soon as they visualized it. Otherwise, it wasn't really clear to anybody, and it was really useful for them to, to specifically say which kind of system they wanted in the community. And now I'm trying to develop this open meta design in two more directions to 
uh, make it easy to people to do open meta design for their own project in open design project. Because of course, if you follow workshop, then you can do it very easily, but then it's not that easy to spread this knowledge. So I'm trying to create one toolkit and one application for that. The toolkit base is a set of canvases. They are digital, but they can also be printed, so you can sketch on the canvas, or you can work digitally with open source software, and then you can include it in your project. The toolkit itself is open source on GitHub, so you can participate in developing that. And the other is an application, it's a Python application that works really well on Linux. It works also on Mac and Windows, but that depends on the configuration of the machine. It's a very simple application, so you just have an input of a standardized way of describing the design process, and then visualize the design process, understanding what you put inside, and then creating an image for that. So it's just a first step towards making it easy to people that doesn't know how to do service design. Because if you can do service design, then you can use the toolkit, but if you're not really familiar with that, then probably this is the right way for working, or it's the easier way. And the idea beside this application is that they standardize the design step uh, with an XML schema. And the idea is that, of course, there is a lot of knowledge and different kind of knowledge in, in design, as Peter Trox explained yesterday. So we have tested knowledge and uh, codified knowledge. And of course, there is a lot of tested knowledge in design. So it's also difficult to uh, take it from the test and make it codified. But at least there is something that we can standardize in some way and it's the design process. So at least we can have different values, different way of design, but at least the process and the flows can be the same. So this is really the first version of the XML schema. So it starts with the basic information about the project. Then uh, an analysis of the community we are designing with and for, specifically if you are starting not with a single uh, project, but with a community. Then we have some space for the business model. I I took it from the business model canvas, so it's also a de facto standard for sketching business models. Then there are all the steps of design, also the design process with all different kind of participation, titles, rules, tools, and actors that are involved. And then for each step, we can have different flows, like in the system map. Now in the system map, you don't have a timeline. You have all the flows at the same time. With this system, you have the flows at different times, so you can also design the whole system in time. Then you can design the different kind of flows and actors and so on. And this is as well as open source. But I didn't wait until the software to be ready. I start from scratch to make it open source. So it's really available to anybody. Also because the XML schema is actually embedded in the software. And it's not just a document. Then the second step is community. It's true that not all the open source projects have a community, but it's also true that the most important successful open source project, they have a community to work with. So in any case, it's something that we should be uh, aware and take care of. And I have one very simple analogy for explaining you how to one way, one good way to address communities. And we can think about a city, for example. Well, it's not just a case because a city is a community itself, or it's a city for small local communities in the neighborhoods. And we can say, okay, I live in a city, like I live in Barcelona, and this okay, is a city, but it does no dimensions. Okay, it's an easy, easy way for explaining that, but you are not saying all the dimensions, it's just a zero dimension node, a zero dimension point. But then actually, in reality, there's much more information, there's much more complexity, uh, not just in the city, but in all territory. It has more than one dimension, more than geographical dimension, social, political, economical. So, of course, we have much more complexity and resource, resources that we can work with. And then, of course, what's happened for past centuries, that we have devised way of mapping the cities or mapping this complexity and making it not just an analysis tool, but also design tools. So this is very easy to understand, and it's also what we've been doing for many centuries. But the question is, why don't we do that for community as well? Because a lot of time we talk about community and say, OK, my project as a community, but it has no dimension. We don't know which kind of community. So I think that it's really important that we map the specific structure of the community. And since a community is something living and evolving, it's a complex system, we should do that by analyzing the social interaction and the social networks. So a lot of my research is also based on doing social network analysis and understanding the social structure of communities. So this is also the shape of the social capital. 
So for example, this is a research I did about the Italian makers community. So if you see, there is one center, which is quite condensed, but also we have a lot of nodes that are just coming to community. So it means the community is growing because we have new people coming to the discussion. And then if you look at the, at the center, the first thing that you see, apart from the size of the node, I mean the importance in some people in bringing more, person, more people to the connection, is that we have different color. Different color means different communities. So we have the community that is more linked to white, the community uh, that started in Milan and Turin, more the pioneers, the community of the researchers and the university. And for example, you see that the community of the pioneers and the university, they are separated. So the world, there was the common discussion, so uh, university uh, stayed a bit behind of the pioneers. So this was one of the things that was very interesting to understand with this. Uh, I'm here, for example. So you can also see where your position is, social structure, and what you can do for also improving the discussion. But this is about the friendships on Facebook. So it's okay, it's about the social capital you can reuse for projects. But then we can also map all the real interaction that happens on the platform. But this is another map. This is the map of the interactions on the platform. And then you see something very different. For example, that only 21% 21% of the people are actually interacting with other people. And of course, that only three people are actually uh, managing all the communication. So you have a different map. And of course, you can also build different maps. It's very important that you understand and you think about what to map before doing that, because there is no one single way of mapping social networks. So for example, this is a network, another network. This comes from the open design definition. It's the network of the people uh, working in the open design definition. The green node are the people working in the open design definition. The red one, they are not working in the definition, but they are on GitHub. And these are people that are following each other. So we see that we have two big nodes and two other small nodes, and we have some people that they work in the definition, but they have no friends. So for example, we should uh, make them more active in the platform, or we should uh, contact all these people through these big nodes. And again, here we can have another different kind of mapping. This is about interaction in the open design definition. And for example, you see that most of the people are not active at all. So that's a big problem for the project, because we have a, a lot of discussion, but between very few people. And again, I'm here. So you see that it's very condensed to very few people, the discussion. And then, of course, that's something that probably you know if you have participated since the beginning, or you know if you do this kind of analysis. So also, most of these uh, networks that you have seen have been done with uh, open source software, and also released all of them as open source software, so you can do this kind of analysis on your own, of course, if you have the knowledge. But investigating a lot of uh, investing a lot of time in also this, this kind of different uh, analysis and mapping different kind of interactions. Then we have the third uh, theme, the business models or the economy for open source projects, which is a very big theme, it usually takes like at least two hours lecture, so we'll try to condense in 15 minutes. And it's very important because uh, usually when I speak to a conference and I talk about the business models of open, open design, there is always somebody saying yes, but open design should be social, so we shouldn't have business model. Or if I don't say anything, there is somebody saying, okay, but how do you make money with that? So the first thing to understand is actually there are a lot of people that could be open designers or makers. And there have been a couple of years ago, this research by Eric von Ippel and others that map the consumers in the UK are actually doing product hacking of uh, product both in the market. And they discovered like 62% of the UK consumers, which means almost like 3 million of people, are actually modifying the products that they buy. An interesting thing is that if you want to have the same kind of innovation, uh, you should spend 2.3 times what all the firms in UK are actually uh, spending in research and development. So there's a huge uh, community of people working. They are not aware that they are a community. Uh, some of them are sharing what they're doing, some others are not. So it's, there is a huge movement possible for open designers and makers. And it means also there's a huge market for uh, tools, projects, and softwares, and so on, publications. So on one side, we can say that in open source software, and also we can extend it to all kind of open source, we have no monetary incentives to work in open source uh, 
software or design. That means we can work for free for problem solving, for ethical questions, because you want to share something, you want to solve an ethical problem, or you want to learn, or you want to uh, have some educational process, or you just want to have a reputation by the peers in the community. And usually that leads to more social interaction and also more jobs. So you can work in open source projects for free, let's say. And this looks more like as a gift economy, which is a kind of the economy or the main economy that are have been possible. It is actually one of the oldest way of exchanging goods. The idea of the gift economy that you give something to somebody else, uh, not for the sake of giving it, not for taking something back, but just for strengthening the relationships. So basically, we are using the flows of goods just to make the social interaction more denser, more richer. But on the other side, we also have monetary incentives to work in open source. And if we forget also this side, we don't fully understand what open source is. So you can work in an open source software by selling the software. You can even do a licensing as open source or proprietary. It really happens a lot. You can offer a service, and that's probably the main business model for open source software. You can be paid to work in open source software. For example, IBM pays a lot of developers to work on the development of the Linux kernel because IBM uses a lot of Linux in its servers. You can have some donations, so you work and then you get a donation in money later. You could develop the software as open source, but then sell the access as a service, so you can have also different kind of business models, so like LinkedIn. You have the freemium, the free version, and the pro version, the premium version. LinkedIn is not open source, but you can do the same. There is also one specific license for that. They are fair GPL, the AGPL. Or you can develop open source software and then embed in hardware and then sell hardware. So on the other side, open source is also a market economy. We have exchange of money uh, for exchanging goods. So here we have uh, the flows. We use the social structure for uh, exchanging goods. So it's mostly the opposite of gift economy. But we are both using the same things, social networks and exchanges. So they're both using the structure of a community uh, to exchange resources and allocate resources. Then if we look at open hardware, which is probably the more advanced uh, development of having open source in physical things, we have also some, already some business models that are possible. You can sell services and expertise, customization, support, as usual. You can manufacture your own open hardware or a third party open hardware, somebody else open hardware. You can manufacture a proprietary hardware based on open hardware, so it's also possible. Dual licensing, again, is even possible, so you can have the version for the community and the version for the companies or the firms. You can also have proprietary hardware design and sell that and base it on open hardware. Or you can also develop software, tools, supporting system for developing open hardware, like toolkits, specific software, specific devices, and so on. So it's really possible to have many different uh, business models for open hardware and also open design. Then there is something more that we can learn, in this case, from the field of 3D printing, of digital fabrication, which gives some insights about the economy of maker's movement and also open design. This is coming from the, uh, the income of a 3D system, which is probably the biggest player in 3D printing. They had a revenue of $100 million last year. What's interesting is that only 28% of their revenue comes from selling 3D printers. 3D Simpson is known for selling 3D printers. So only one third of their revenue is coming from that. Another third comes from selling materials, plastics, resins, and so on. But then 40%, which is a huge percentage in this case, come from selling services and the contents and materials. So even these big players, they diversificate and they have different kind of revenues in the same company. So it's very important also for open design business to have different kind of revenues and sources of income. Then there is something that's really interesting, is that, yes, we have some companies that are actually working in open design, and actually there are a lot of companies that are called Shanzai in China. Shanzai means like bandits hiding in the mountains. And these are all the companies that are actually start by copying products, specifically, usually most of them are about mobile phone. And they copy the mobile phones not because they're lazy, because they don't want to do innovation. They do that as a way of learning how to develop their own mobile. Because usually they start by copying mobiles, and then after a few months or years, then they start developing their own products and their own brands. And they actually sell a lot in the third world countries. 
And they actually sell a lot in the third world countries, for example. So they were so powerful in learning uh, by copying uh, design uh, how to do their own brand and their own products. And what's interesting that they all share what they do with all the other communities and all the other um, companies in their own local community. So they're actually doing open design if they don't call it open design. But it's important that for them it's a way for speeding up innovation and development of products. And sometimes you can see some product like this. This is a fake iPhone, which is even better than the normal iPhone because you can even replace the battery. Then another side of the business model of open design is very important for the future is that many businesses are increasingly uh, developing open APIs for their own system. So they have an interface for software for accessing the data and their services. So you don't need to work inside, for example, Shapeways, but you can write a code and use Shapeways API for interacting with Shapeways data and services. So you can create a software that creates some kind of design, upload and sell it. What's important is that increasingly more and more companies are having this kind of open APIs and they are connecting machines and the manufacturing machine to the internet uh, with what is called not Internet of Things, but industrial internet. So it's different from Internet of Things. And here it's important also, not just because it makes things easier for us to develop something, develop a business about open design, but also because it means that in the future a lot of business models will be open source software, or at least will be software, then of course we can open source it. Because the business model will be embedded into the code that works with the platform. So it's very important to understand that software is eating also the business uh, development of design, also on the process side. Then there are a couple of features that explain clearly the difference between proprietary development and an open design or open source development. So here is, for example, the development of Windows. And then if you see that uh, along the years, you have two different lines of products and they even merge it. So along the years, you have even less choice and less possibilities. And less, there is a lot of development, but it's focusing on few things. So you have a lot of less choice in possible. But well, actually, what you get with an open source system is completely opposite. But this is, for example, the development of Linux. So it's completely opposite because you see from one project, you have many more projects possible. It doesn't mean that all these projects are successful, but it means they can be. Of course, some of them are really successful, like Ubuntu, for example. But it means that you have a shared platform for doing innovation and developing products and also business, starting from a common platform. And one thing that is interesting from this graph, that is, this, is, this was done in 2007, and newest versions of this graph are so big that they don't fit into screen. So it's even growing larger than this. There is even more evolution. And if you have a look of the development of RepRap, of the RepRap 3D printer, you can see something similar. So it's a common pattern of open source software and design and hardware, or at least the most successful projects that they generate this kind of ecosystem and this kind of evolution of a project. And then about business, uh, it's important to understand that it's not just about making money, and making money is not, only, it's not just evil, but you can do a lot of things with business models and, and money itself. For me, there's just one way of having some kind of specific interaction. So for example, you can have some different kind of currencies design, currencies that they foster competition, especially if you charge an interest. Currencies that it might be peer-to-peer -peer and they are mutual, and then you force the collaboration. So it depends on the kind of design that you have in the currency. And there's a lot of experimentation right now in, design, in designing new kind of currencies. So this is, for example, one thing I've been working on. This is a project I did last year in the Fab Academy. It's completely digitally fabricated in a Fab Lab. It's called Fab Money. It's a device for having uh, exchange in the Fab Lab. Uh, exchanges are based on collaboration. So you exchange one fab between people in the, in the fab lab when you have collaboration or when you want to sell something. And the idea behind this is this is using RFID for having everybody has its own identity. So you can use the RFID also for different services like accessing the fab lab. The idea is that you let people decide when to have this kind of transaction. And there is that everybody, everything in the system is open source. So it's open source the hardware, it's open source the software, it's open source design, and everything is also output outside as open data. So you can access what's happening inside the community. 
And since we are asking people to map the collaboration, and also we are mapping the social interactions in the community, and since it's open, open data, you can access online the actual structure of the community in real time. And this is something that I'm still developing. Probably it won't be based on the hardware in the future. It makes more sense to have a mobile application, but it will be open source. Also because this is the kind of project that can benefit a community like the Fab Labs uh, if it's open source. If you want to make money out of this, then you have to charge interest. And that basically means that you have a competition currency, not a collaboration. And then most likely we'll develop it further in a fab lab I'm developing in Italy, in Muse. This is a new museum designed by Enzo Piano. It's a science museum, and one part of the museum is dedicated to the fab lab, uh, because they wanted to have some space for uh, visitors to understand what it means to have sustainable practice and what it means to produce something physical and how to make it more sustainable. And I think that we'll probably develop fab money more in this part, but any fab lab is welcome in developing fab money and making something for the community not something as a single process or project. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask about, uh, to, there are two questions about visualizing the forks. How do you, because in this, when you visualize the makers, it seems like a conglomerate, but the, in, in this kind of open process, you can fork the design and you can kind of get out of the radar. So how do you deal with that when you are kind of visualizing the, the process? Like, okay, this is one process, but when it forks, it's, it's still the same process, it's part of another process. How do you deal with these discontinuities? And also, this is in some way related with, uh, as David was talking yesterday, with Thingiverse. I don't know if you are concerned about GitHub having the same route. Like, there are a lot of open repositories that are outside GitHub, uh, using GitHub as a kind of backup of their own repositories. But how do you deal with, the, with this kind of thing? Because GitHub is right now moving also into enterprise system for collaboration, like most enterprises, like Microsoft, offer the repositories and they're trying to say this is not the right way to develop or we offer a better way to collaborate and they're trying to push GitHub into the enterprise also. So do you think in the future they will try to be acquired by Microsoft or Oracle or some of the big players in industry? Well, the first thing is that the idea is that you have this visualization of the design process and you embed it with your own project. It's always in the same folder, or in the same zip file, or in the same repository. So when you fork it, it stays in this repository, so you change starting from that. Uh, the good thing of platform like GitHub is it's very easy to fork, and it's all in the same platform, and it has very nice API, so you can also always mine the data and understand what's happening. So that's, I think, probably one of the most good parts about GitHub. Um, and yes, it's very, it's very true that GitHub is, is very friendly to open source, but you, you never know what's happening in the future. And probably it's very important also for the open source community to understand that the more we rely on this kind of platform, the more probably will be dangerous if they close in the future. So probably we, we should, need, should develop also open source tools for people to develop their own platform in this case. That, that's very important. But it's also uh, very typical of this time when people probably start more a startup than just an open source project. It's increasingly more based on startup on this kind of. I think so. It's very typical of this time. Any other questions? Okay, I, I actually was wondering about something. Um, possibly because I'm not really a practicing designer, so I'm not uh, deeply into this kind of world. But I was just wondering there's the fact that there has been a language of communicating design which has been established over 150 years, a way of drawing up um, visual information, a way of talking about processes and so forth, um, which, you know, in, in, in the way in which craft objects get developed through time and perfected through time has gone through all that and it works quite well. Um, and here you have been des describing 
the creation, almost it feels to me ex novo, of a completely new kind of language to communicate design and the design process. Um, and my question is, how necessary do you really think this new language is to communicate and to do open design? Is what we have now not good enough and why? Well, yes, this comes also from the, the difference between the tested knowledge and the codified knowledge in design. And then, of course, it's probably even useless to try to codify everything, but at least uh, for a few things can be codified and we can agree that may be a standard. And then, of course, this is one proposal and I made it open source because if it's not the right proposal, we can modify and make it a different way. Uh, the problem is, I just started this in 2005, but I think it's still valid right now. Because if you see, most of the open design projects are developed by, by one or a few designers and then they put outside everything. So you don't have the same system like Linux where you have a lot of people working on the same time on the same project. This is also, this is, there is also two kind of, two kind of uh, perspective in open source and free software. Like in sharing because it's good, because it's ethical, or having an open process because it can solve problems in a quicker way. Uh, both are important, but what really uh, is interesting to me is having much more people working on complex problems, because then you have a complex system solving complex problems in a faster way. So also what I'm trying to achieve is not just by sharing things, but also making more people work, to work together. So the idea was like, okay, let's have one standard, and then we agree on something about that. It's not all of it, it's just one subset of things, but at least we know a bit how to work together at the same time. And I tested it with many workshops, and it's, it's, it's working with the people in the workshops. But mainly the problem is just to let people understand how to codify things. And codify it in a common way, that's the biggest um, obstacle to it. But you're talking mostly about software design or, or hardware design as well? Uh, no designers. Right. Industrial okay. designer, graphic designer, but no software. No software developers. Also something that's important, of course, uh, I don't want to be techno determinist because I'm, I'm not as such, but uh, there is a lot of uh, social interaction that can be shaped by tools. And for example, the same things happen in open source software with version control system that, that, that enable a way of working uh, collaboratively on a mass scale. So in the case of Linux, uh, Linux store was had to develop Git for having the, the system for all, having all the people working together at the same time. So it was one specific tool that enabled this kind of thing. So that's also what we are missing. And we saw yesterday we did a design with Git example. There is something about that. There is some example. But it's possible to use it as a designer. It's a bit complicated at the beginning. You have to do some hacks, some kind of tricks, but then you can use it. But it's still, there is still also a big gap between being a single open designer and being a collaborative in an open project. Uh, open design can be applied to many, many different things. One thing that, for example, I would like to see it is uh, in the design of public service with service design. Because then you can address social problems at the city level in a much quicker way. But then, of course, you need to have a lot of people working together at the same time. So you have to make them clear how the things are working. Thanks. Sí, eh, Máximo, cuando hablamos, hablas de diseño más orientado a, digamos, al diseño industrial o de producto, sí que veo claro ¿no? la manera de sistematizar o generar el kit este de, de herramientas, incluso el repositorio de diseños. ¿no? Pero ¿qué pasa cuando, en lo, en lo que tiene más que ver con procesos de desarrollo de sistemas humanos, ¿no? Y cuando lo que queremos es que las propias personas eh, participen en el desarrollo de sus propios sistemas, ¿no? pues por ejemplo en temas de participación ciudadana o desarrollo de territorio, si tienes ejemplos que tengan que ver con eso y si hay herramient bueno, herramientas, me imagino que puede haberlas, y ya lo de los kits no, no lo tengo claro, ¿no? si son como repetibles, escalables o reutilizables y ese tipo de cosas. Si la idea es que lo puedes aplicar a cualquier proceso de diseño. Y cualquier proceso de diseño puede ser también no el típico diseño. Yo he trabajado también mucho con algunos biotecnólogos que querían aprender cómo aplicar el Open Design a sus investigaciones. Pero claro que no, no, es, no es el mundo del diseño, pero lo, lo aplicaron, lo intentaron de todos modos. Hay una cosa muy importante que entender que no, no es posible directamente diseñar los sistemas humanos, los sistemas sociales, ¿no? Sobre todo si los ves como sistemas complejos que evolucionan a lo largo del tiempo. O sea, no, no puedes 
decir, tú eres amigo de esta persona directamente. Lo que puedes hacer es como favorecer las dinámicas. Entonces, lo difícil de todos esos sistemas que no puedes directamente diseñar como harías con un producto, pero tienes que eh, entender cómo escuchar, analizar, hablar mucho con esos sistemas e intentar mucho prototipando en realidad cómo esos sistemas pueden eh, funcionar. Por ejemplo, es muy importante la segunda parte la, de, la, de la comunidad de análisis, porque claro, yo no me pensé, diciendo, si sí, diseñamos el proceso juntos, pero una cosa es si decimos lo que vamos a hacer y la otra cosa es lo que pasa en realidad. Entonces es muy importante, sí, hablar juntos de lo que hacer, pero analizarlo al mismo tiempo. Y si analizas con las redes sociales, por ejemplo, puedes ver si de verdad está pasando lo que nos, nos decidimos, y si está pasando bien, o si sea, hay parte de la comunidad que se está destrozando, si no estamos creando capital social. Eso sí. Y hay muchas herramientas en muchas disciplinas como urbanística y arquitectura uh, para trabajar con participación. De hecho, el participation metrics lo saqué de la, de la urbanística. Thanks, Massimo, for your talk. Um, we can share zeros and ones. We can share open source code. Um, we can share open source hardware. But uh, like Viviana, I worry that this still isn't accessible to a larger population, a larger population of people who are professional designers and amateur designers and citizen designers. So. Sharing of CAD files, for instance, I mean, open source CAD files, that perhaps widens the audience a little bit. And sharing of downloadable patterns, paper printed patterns, that widens the audience a little bit more. Um, do you think this is a debate we need to have about how we get open design out from uh, a very open source environment into a wider, more public environment? by offering different elements that are open. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, there is one thing to, to remember, at least if you want to uh, decide the future of open design, that we always, always think open source is something that's democratic and anybody can do that. But actually, it's something done by professionals for professionals. So if you want to have the same kind of things in open design, maybe it will be by professional for professionals. In any case, you need a lot of knowledge on one side, for example, in open source, you need knowledge for developing the software, but you need also the knowledge of working collaboratively with the tools and all the rules and so on. So maybe they still need for a lot of knowledge even for collaborating, not something that happened magically. You need some kind of knowledge. Uh, but it's true that it's uh, important to make things as simple as possible, because otherwise we cannot have a lot of people uh, participate in that. So if we're having a broader open design, then yes, we have to work in simplifying things. And that's why also I'm trying in this case, uh, at least for working with repository, and of course, if you want to work in, in a different uh, tools, in a different settings, you can have different ways of doing that. And uh, in one way, in any case, you can simplify the tools, but in another way, you need also to have a lot of learning and education for the people. So for example, the first time I went to the Fab Lab, I was thinking, yes, this is a place which is democratizing the access to machines, so it should be very easy, but then I realized that you need to have a lot of knowledge about using machines and designing with them. So it's something that is very typical of these kind of systems. One thing that can be a solution is to uh, design the roles of the people participating in the system, and having some people that act as an interface between the professionals and the non-professionals. So like in the system map that I showed you before, there was this public relation role that was acting as an interface between the people designing something, the people outside of the community, and managing all the flows, at least of the physical flows and the money source, money flows. So probably it's something like a design uh, thing to have an interface between the professionals and non-professionals. Well, I think that's an interesting proposition, isn't it? That if we can encourage more openness between professionals by sharing more of the professional tools, but maybe it's a big step for an ordinary citizen to, to get involved and they need other kinds of elements to work with. And so, yes, maybe this layer of an interface to take professional information really into the public domain. By that I mean a, a domain where the public can use it. 
because I think that's the problem with a lot of uh, digitally orientated openness. It's still not very usable by the general public. And if we're interested in a critical mass for this open design movement, we have to engage the general public, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that in any case that you can really design a specific system. So the idea also for meta design that if you design with one community and they have a specific knowledge, if, if they are like no ordinary citizens, they are not professional, but they have their own knowledge. So if you're designing with the people that are part don't know, of, of a science community, then probably you can work with some specific tools. If they are more, I don't know, low, working with low, then you can use some other specific contents. So usually, uh, the one, the easy uh, reply to the questions about this system, how do you do things, is that you do a customized thing for having specific community. So it's also the good idea of having open source for, play, for uh, distributing good experiments in other places. So you have uh, something that you can modify and adapt to the local context. That probably is the most important thing for open source also, for making it success successful. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, that's all the time we have uh, for questions. So thank you very much, Massimo, for your talk. <laughs>